The views and opinions expressed on Maine Challenge are solely those of the program participants and do not necessarily reflect or represent the views and opinions of Lincoln County Television, its employees, or the producers of this program. Maine Challenge is a production of Lincoln County Indivisible. Coming up on Maine Challenge, my conversation with Commissioner of Labor, Laura Fortman. <laughs> Welcome to Maine Challenge. We are so excited this week to have as our guest, Commissioner of Labor here in Maine, Laura Fortman. I am uh, so grateful to have Laura with us today, and I am more grateful that Laura and I have been in the trenches working together for almost 40 years, since we were two. Um, <laughs> and, um, and she started her work in the domestic violence movement. She worked for the Maine Women's Lobby for a long time. Um, she was the commissioner of labor under John Baldacci for a time. She went to work for the wage and labor division in the federal government. Um, she was the head of the Francis Perkins Center, um, which we'll come back to. And she is now the commissioner of labor in charge of all things fair in the labor market, wages, unemployment, um, everything that has to do with your job, Laura is involved in it. So Laura, thank you so much for being with us and welcome to the main challenge. Oh, thank you so much, Betsy. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. And as you said, we've been uh, working together for close to 40 years, um, but you described the work much better than I could and much shorter than I did, which is basically if it has anything to do with somebody's job, the Department of Labor is probably involved in some way. Yes, and, and I also, I know that you carry in it your former role as captain of the women. And so, <laughs> so I think that we all feel good that, that you're there about that. So Laura, I know it's been an incredibly difficult, challenging time for everyone going through COVID. But one of the first things that happened obviously was people lost their jobs, businesses were losing worker, you know, trying to stay safe. Tell us a little bit about how it's going, how you're feeling. Um, it seems certainly that things have um, even out, I know you were just smashed with thousands and thousands of unemployment claims and had to staff up and all of that. So tell us how it's going now. Where are you now? Sure. Well, I, I think in order to understand where we are now, we also do have to just spend a minute looking at what you described in very top line. I mean, from February to April, we lost 105,000 jobs. So, and it was almost overnight. Um, as you had said, I served as labor commissioner during the Baldacci administration. We went through the Great Recession then. I swear it has nothing to do with me being in these positions. <laughs> <laughs> but, but one of the big differences was that with the Great Recession, there was a gradual downturn um, and uh, there was time to prepare. This time it was almost overnight. So it was um, not just an influx of uh, a dramatic increase in the number of people who desperately needed benefits, but also many folks, because the economy has changed, were not eligible for traditional unemployment yes, insurance. Yes. And so all of those people that we think of as you know, gig workers or self-employed are left out of the basic social safety net program that unemployment is. Um, and so having to address that, Congress did take some action, did take time to ramp up, but it pointed out some significant gaps in um, policy. Right. So if that's the, um, the silver lining, let, let me just say that I know that so many, and you had to staff up unbelievably fast um, in a time when people weren't that excited about coming into work or weren't able to come into work because of COVID. So it just is a, uh, I mean, I think it's very challenging, but I wanna to go to the point that you just said, which is COVID has sort of laid bare, I think, a number of those gaps um, in a lot of areas, but certainly in, the terms, in terms of employment. And I think, um, so what, I mean, you said already the number of gig workers, the number of self-employed people, what other gaps did you know, to, have you seen that like COVID has said, oh my God, like, <laughs> whoa, we have to do something about this. This is Yeah, really I mean, one of the other gaps, in addition to uh, just not having any protections, it's were the protections that we had in place adequate to meet the needs? Was the basic um, level of unemployment insurance enough for folks? Congress took some significant actions by expanding federal programs to people who were self-employed gig workers. They also recognized that across the country, 
the amount that someone would receive in unemployment insurance, it was always intended to be a partial wage replacement, but it fell significantly below what someone would need to survive. So they included a federal pandemic unemployment compensation. So that was that plus up of $600 to just try to get people by. That only lasted until July. Uh, and then when Congress acted again in December, that that plus up is now $300. But I think it pointed out that not only is it a partial wage replacement, but it's raising the question of whether or not it is adequate if people are losing their jobs. The other thing that we're seeing is that it's what economists are calling a K-shaped recovery. So you yeah. have that dramatic drop, and then the people who are in low-wage jobs are in the bottom part of the K, and the people who are um, in jobs where you can work remotely and are paid better are in that upper part. So we're seeing a very different recovery for people who have positions that you're able to work remotely in. And for those folks who do that direct facing um, uh, work that we count on so much. Yeah, well, that's interesting. And you know, at the top of that K, I mean, one of the things that I know sticks in my craw, and I'm sure it does in yours too, that we have people at the very top of that K making billions of dollars in profits um, off of the pandemic at Amazon and other places. And that is not filtering down to the workers that are at the bottom of the K. Um, and so that's a continual frustration. But let me ask, so some of those things that we're realizing about the inadequacy, the inadequate amount of pay, the inclusion of self-employed and gig workers in this, what do you think the chances are, Laura, that, that is going to, those are going to stay or there's going to be any impetus to actually make those permanent fixes in the system? Well, I think in order for them to be permanent, one of the uh, challenges is that unemployment insurance is a federal state partnership. And some of those programs really need to happen at the federal level. I think there's more conversation about how do you make um, both policy changes to unemployment at the federal level, as well as how do you make sure that the technology pieces are in place in order to respond more quickly. Um, so I think that there is a, there's a lot of discussion happening, and this is the first time I've heard that level of discussion. Uh, in uh, it, We heard it briefly during the Great Recession, and then it disappeared. I think there's more energy behind it now to look at those fundamental changes. Oh, good. I hope so, because I think that I, certainly the people on the receiving end, it's very frustrating. You know, first week they got the $600 bump, then they got nothing, then the state stepped in with 300, now the feds are stepping in with an, a, a potentially uh, you know, the 300. So I think it's a little, um, it's very disconcerting as someone living on a budget. And one of the things that I'm curious about how you can help um, or how you help legislators at the state level and even at the federal level understand, it seemed to me that as, as someone who is self-employed, <laughs> um, you know, when I talked to the congressional delegations about how long it took for that, you know, for us to wait, and people kept saying, they're going to have to live on their savings. I was like, do you know who's self-employed? Because we don't have a lot of savings put away. You know, like, it just felt like they're, th that the policymakers in Washington were really, most of them, not all of them, but many of them out of touch with how people really are living their lives. And I don't know how we, um, in, in what way can you, as a commissioner of labor, help to sort of paint that picture of what it's like for people on that bottom end of the K? I think that there's more conversation than has ever happened before. Um, because also, like typically in a recession, you may have different parts of the country that are hit harder than other parts of the country. <clears throat> what this pandemic has done is it's leveled that playing field that you have kind of unanimity across the country, that th this is what people are experiencing in their states, and this is what people need um, as support and help. So I think that there is a more unified voice coming from all of the states about the needs of the people, and also um, you know, that you can't just um, make, wave a magic wand and somehow take care of these issues, that they need to be addressed thoughtfully that it's a combination of not just saying, oh, let's put this um, unemployment insurance for self-employed people in place, and then it starts tomorrow. You need to have the technology, the staffing, and the regulations um, and guidance around that all in place. So it, uh, and those are the conversations that are taking place now in a way that I really haven't seen before, Betsy. I think there is a recognition that the economy has changed, 
And if we are really going to be supportive of people, that we need to look at um, how we can help people um, when there is an economic downturn. And, and there's a, a very clear recognition of who, who was going to fall through the cracks um, mm -hmm. before if we just stuck with the traditional um, unemployment programs that are in place in states across the country. Okay. Well, that's promising, you know, that there's going to be some of that recognition. Because I think that in addition to sort of who's working, and I want to talk a little bit more about that, but it's also, there's huge changes now. I think there's going to be huge changes after COVID in how we work, mm -hmm. right? The, the number of people who are going to work from home, the flex time, things that you and I fought for years ago, um, now seem to be not just a matter of course, but I think some businesses are finding that this is actually more productive for their people. What, have you, are you seeing that? Are, people, are business owners talking to you about that at all? Yeah, I think they're talking about a couple of things. Um, one is that we do have the main job bank and we list jobs that are available and there are about 14,000 jobs on there now. And employers are really looking at how can we recruit people? And so we're working with them to highlight those very things that you talked about because many employers are either offering flex time where the flip side of that is um, predictable scheduling because you may want it one way or the other. Either you need the ability to flex it or you need the ability to plan what your work is going to look like. So mm -hmm. depending on your situation, you may really want to know that you're working Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during certain hours so that you can make sure that you've got childcare and, it, it, and you can't have a lot of fluctuation in there. We're also, um, you know, employers who are emphasizing the safety precautions that they're taking and their workplace so that the workplace is, um, is uh, appropriately recognizing the health, um, you, know, uh, you know, possibilities and protecting against COVID um, are better able to recruit employees who are concerned about those health concerns. Mm -hmm. And employers who are able to say that they uh, provide a, um, flexibility to work from home are also having better luck recruiting. Um, mm -hmm. And we're doing, we're doing job fairs that way too. We're doing virtual job fairs. We're doing drive-through job fairs. Um, employers are adapting and employees are as well. Wow. Well, and I think, you know, again, it's so many things that we have fought for for a long time just to make life work. And it's interesting that a pandemic has really opened up the eyes, I think, of a lot of employers to say, oh, well, we don't have to do it the same way that we've always done it for 100 years, because maybe there's other ways to do that. So I, th um, I think the other thing, though, Betsy, is, yeah. is about the access to broadband. I mean, yes. I think that this has really brought it home. Um, you know, if you're if you're trying to work from home and you have children who are trying to go to school from home, you know, access to reliable broadband is absolutely critical. And so I think there's um, there's a greater awareness and a recognition that this is an essential infrastructure piece that we need yeah. in order to yeah. thrive. Yeah, I think that's true. And I I was um, heartened to hear Buttigieg, who's a transportation guy, saying that this was in terms of infrastructure. You know, he's about roads and stuff now is in his job, but that this was one of the most important things because we really are seeing, I think, Laura, and I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on this. It seems like the, con the economy just continues to divide further and further with a whole swath of people in the service economy, um, a whole swath of people, you know, whether they're direct care workers for health care or they're retail workers or they're hourly workers. Um, and then this whole other, you know, the top of the K folks. And, and, and it seems like in the middle, there's not a lot going on. So it seems like we either have to figure out how to lift up the people at the bottom of the K and, or, or do create new things or, you know, so what are you seeing as you look towards the future in terms of the kinds of jobs that, you know, you're hoping for Maine to attract or keep or, you know, keep here? Well, I think um, one of the areas that there's a lot of promise in is clean energy. Um, you know, and those, uh, yeah. those jobs um, are the jobs of the future and uh, do, re you know, require uh, technical skills. And I, I think that, um, you know, Maine uh, is positioned well to do uh, some exciting job creation in that space. And again, that's an area that the governor has really taken a lead on. Um, you know, there's a climate council that was uh, just kind of getting up and running prior to the pandemic and even during the pandemic. 
kept um, kept plugging away and is positioned um, for um, for what we are doing as part of the recovery. So I think there's a lot of promise there. I think the collaboration between the community college system and the workforce system um, is another area where we're looking to really leverage the strengths that each bring. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, um, the learn while you earn um, mechanism mm -hmm. of apprenticeship, another, another thing yes. that we've worked on for a long time. So I think that there are a lot of promising practices um, and uh, the other thing I think the pandemic has done is really bring people together, um, you know, to, uh, to brainstorm and recognize, as you've pointed out, the world is fundamentally changing. How do we um, adapt to it and then, um, you know, maximize the benefits for main people? Yeah. Wow. Well, it's interesting that all of it comes together, right? And, and I think that has been the promise of the Green New Deal and the, you know, uh, and clean energy, whatever we want to call it. Um, you know, I think Maine is well poised to sort of take advantage of that if we can get through this, <laughs> this pandemic bump. Um, and I know it's still happening during, during this as well, but I think that's a place. But let's talk for a minute about those. Um, one of the places where I spend a lot of my time is with direct care service workers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now we are, um, you know, it's, the competition. So these are people who take care of people with mental illness and elderly and um, people with development disabilities. And there's a huge swath of Maine's labor market. And right now they're, they're competing and, and their agencies are competing not with each other, which always happened, but with Walmart and, you know, with, um, you know, McDonald's, people who are paying way more than the state has been able to reimburse agencies to pay folks. And so we're losing this whole level of um, direct care service workers who want to do, you know, who want to do a good thing and care about it, but it doesn't make sense if you're, you know, in these very difficult jobs making, you know, an hour and you can McDonald's and make $17 an hour, you know, so it's like, it, it, do you see any way that we can start to change the narrative and start to recognize, I mean, as essential workers, like we know who essential workers now, is there going to be any push to try and up the wages and up the experience for those essential workers? Well, I think that there has been a, a recognition. I mean, you had mentioned I worked for the U.S. Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division. I mean, one of the things that we did there was making sure that those workers were covered um, by the basic fair labor standards protections um, and that they would at least receive minimum wage, yeah. uh, which it, it, many of those folks had been um, exempt from even that, that mm -hmm. level of support. Um, I, I think for the state of Maine, uh, one of the uh, key sectors that we have been looking into is the healthcare workforce. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has hired a uh, workforce uh, coordinator specifically to look at healthcare workforce and um, she's working very closely uh, with, with the folks in the public workforce system to come up with a plan. Because again, it's not a, it's not a, uh, a one, stop, you know, it's not yes, one right. step, not one thing. Yeah. it's multi, it's multi prong that you have to do. It's a, you know, how do you recruit people? How do you make sure that these jobs are not only um, essential, as you said, which we recognize, but also are quality jobs mm -hmm. um, and quality means different things to different people. But how do you put that package together? Um, because yeah. it is wages, but it's also working conditions. Yes. It's also opportunity for advancement. Right, career path. And, and yes. again, it's, it's all of those things that we need to look at all of it. And there is definitely a commitment from the Mills administration to look at that entire package. Oh, wow, great. Well, I want to get back to some um, philosophy and some underlying things, but um, it, would be, it would be a mistake, I think, for, for people who are watching who have unemployment issues or who are having struggles. What's the best way? And I know that that was way worse when you're trying to, to staff up, and, but I think it feels like it's um, evened out now. But if someone is unemployed or someone is facing unemployment or um, as we go further, What's the best way for them to reach you? What are some of the services that you guys put out there that people can access for individual help? So if you're trying to, um, you know, the two sides of the coin are unemployment and reemployment. And I think many people right now are really trying to figure out what does reemployment look like? And the best place to access that information is at the career centers. And um, there's information online, I think www 
www.maincareercenter.com uh, or .gov. I should know that, .gov. Um, <laughs> and, um, and that would be the first place that I would go. You can schedule one-on-one -on -one, um, appointments. This can be done virtually. Uh, it can be done over the phone. Uh, and then there are one-on-one -on -one, uh, physical appointments that are available to help you do some career exploration, okay. particularly for those people you were talking about before, Betsy, who may be unemployed at the moment and thinking, you know, I want to figure out how do I get um, a career path that's more secure and to help you think through that. Also connect people with free training that's available right yes. now. Yeah. There, are, there are the community college, I think they have 22 free classes at this point in time. Um, we did a, a free program with Coursera um, where uh, thousands of Maine people participated in courses online ranging from uh, how to improve your business skills. It could have been like a Excel program, could have been a marketing piece. Um, that now may be a good time to do that, to do a skill assessment and figure out where is it that you want to be and help position you for that. Um, our website has been uh, redesigned for the career centers. We're rolling out new information on the main job bank, which will also allow you to do um, explore the jobs that are out there, as well as put your resume out for employers to look at. Um, but the website is the first place I would encourage people to go for the department for either unemployment information, we update our FAQs and things like that, and the career centers. Um, I would also say, because there are people who prefer calling, um, while it is much better than it was back in the spring where we had like 250,000 phone calls a day, and I'm not making that number up, um, <laughs> <laughs> we, like half we, the population of me. <laughs> it doesn't mean we had 250,000 people. Because I know, just first, to <laughs> from a dial, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it actually crashed the whole state uh, telephone system. Wow. Um, so we're now off on our own little island. Um, but um, it, if you call, the beginning of the week is always the busiest. Monday and Tuesday are very busy, but by Thursday or Friday, um, if you want to call, uh, those are best days to try to call. Um, and uh, we answer, each, we actually speak to between uh, 2,200 and 2,500 people a day right now. Wow, wow, yeah. that's great. All right, well, that is all really, really helpful information. So, all right, so if you needed that, there it is. <laughs> but let me just, like, I want to go back now, to back to policy. So, you know, one of the uh, things that's raging nationally is this question of, um, especially when it comes to economic stimulus, but also jobs and, you know, um, what we're doing is sort of going big versus incremental approach, right? So like, and we've heard the president say, we have to go bold. We've heard a lot of folks in Congress saying we have to go big and bold. I think even Chuck Schumer said it the other day. So, and I also know that, um, as the head of the Francis Perkins Center, you did a lot of work. And I mean, I always think if, if we wanna think about going bold to get out of a recession, to get out of somewhere, Frances Perkins is the role model, right? She is the one who said to FDR, you know, she wrote the new deal. She said, if you don't do this, we're not gonna win. And he believed her for some reason, which is awesome. Yep. Um, and so I, I just wanna, my favorite Frances Perkins story is when she was in Maine and they needed women, and you, I know you know this, but they needed women to work during the war and they said, well, how, you know, everyone was wringing their hands, mostly men, wringing their hands. How are we gonna get women to work? And she said, you want women to work? You provide daycare, you have hot meals. When you, they pick up the kids, they take the hot meals home. That's how you get women to work. And so, and they, they were like, oh, okay. So it's like, it's not rocket science, but it's been so hard for us to get there. So if Frances Perkins were here now, <laughs> she were your, she were your, she were your uh, advocate for the Department of Labor, what are the big and bold things that you are hoping that we get some <laughs> steam behind that it would really make a difference for Maine workers? I, I, I think that um, childcare is definitely one of them. I, I think that, mm -hmm. as, as you've said, it's not just during the Great Recession. I mean, it was during World War II as well. We, we have to figure out uh, childcare. The Children's Cabinet is looking at it. Um, again, before the pandemic, it was trying to map out where are the gaps. Um, but if this pandemic showed us um, one thing, it was the fact that unless people have uh, childcare that's reliable, quality, 
um, their women are going to drop out of the, the labor market. Um, and we are seeing that. So I think that's one of the issues that has to be addressed. Again, Francis Perkins was trying to deal with it from a national level, which on some, um, in some ways is more challenging and in other ways, if you're going to make those big bold policy changes, uh, you have to have a national uh, partner and platform. Yeah, yeah, um, and because I mean, the childcare comes from both for the for the parents who need it and the women who need it, but also workers. for the childcare workers, workers who are one of those yeah. essential workers who have not been valued enough to get paid enough yeah. to have people stay and have a career path in those fields. So it's a it's the yeah. perfect uh, storm, perfect juggernaut that we have to fix. So yeah, that's a big one. And paid leave? What about paid leave? I, I mean, I'm again? hearing that on the federal level, there is interest in that as well. You know, there has been, I think, Betsy, you were at the women's lobby um, when uh, the uh, when Maine passed the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, yeah, and so, you know, that's un, unpaid job protected leave, which was a huge leap forward. Um, and, uh, you know, people have been uh, trying to transition into some sort of paid leave program in Maine now for, you know, at least, at least 20 years. Um, and I think that, too, is one of those um, bold ideas that the pandemic has illustrated the need for and also um, the necessity of, I think, some federal leadership on that issue from states that are uh, fairly small states um, mm -hmm. like Maine. Um, yeah. Most of the states that have been able to implement paid leave programs on a state level um, have been able to build on temporary disability insurance programs that they already had mm -hmm. in existence. So, um, but I, th I think those are all issues that people are, people are excited about and trying to figure out answers to. Uh, yeah, which is awesome. So, and it's unbelievable, but um, we are at the end of our time, Laura, we and I could chat forever. Um, there's so many important things, but I think that those ideas of childcare and paid leave and taking care of people at the bottom and broadband, getting like seriously broadband everywhere, because otherwise you can't participate in the economy. I think about all the people who have bought houses sight unseen from New York and Connecticut and what they're going to realize when they get here that they can't actually do their work from here because there's no, they don't have a reliable internet. So anyway, but they will come and they are coming and the workforce is changing. And I just want to say thank you so much for being at the helm and being such a steady hand there. It's great to have your expertise and your experience and your passion for workers of Maine um, in that spot. So thank you very much for joining me today, Laura. Um, thank thank you. you all for watching the Maine Challenge and um, if you have issues, go to their website. And uh, Laura is one of the most transparent and responsive people I know. So we are in very good hands, even as we struggle through this very difficult time. So thanks, Laura, for being with us. Thank you, Betsy. Show your support for Maine Challenge and LCTV's programming. We're all about community. Please go to lctv.org to make a contribution. Your support makes us stronger together.